personal reasons. I'm sure all of us has a passion that why we joined technology. So I will be talking about these futuristic devices. How many people are hopeful that something will become? Please, there were some efforts to have a human dialysis, but it was not used. It was not until I think Dr. Paul he in, invented this first rotating drum dialysis in 1940s, and then he also reported in 1960s a home dialysis device, which was a portable using sorbet technology. It was used, but later on it was never developed. Like some of the startup company had an idea, tested, but it did not become a reality. So these were some of the you know picture I got from his own article. So these four machines, back in 1940s, one was sent to London, one to New York, one to Montreal, and one to Poland, which was, I think, I believe, his homeland, and before he immigrated to USA. So, so this was, uh, you know, in 1969, Gordon and Maxwell. So they kind of gave this idea of portable dialysis. So on one hand, you see this. It's in the experiment, so you can see the hemodialyzer in the center. So there is arterial output blood from dialysis and venous return, the blood circuit. But there was also this dialysis circuit, so the water which was there was reused. What do we do with all in the dialysis unit with all waters? You know, liters of water, gallons of fluid, the treatment is just wasted. So they use this uh, zirconium and some sort of uh, uh, you know, sorbent technology to reuse the water. So instead of kind of wasting the water, the water is reused again and again. So the blood circuit is going on and dialysis circuit is going on as well, but the water is reused. So again, this concept was there, but I don't think it took a lot of, you know, popularity. So the idea was there in some, some sort of experiment, but died. But Dr. Paul, he experimented this machine and reported its use. He was a, a genius innovator in the technology world. Also, he invented the first artificial heart and membrane oxygenator. So, kind of the membrane oxygenator are used in ECMO devices and cardiac bypass. So, those were some of his inventions. And I think he's wearing one of his devices he invented. Uh, he described the his experience as dialysis in Wonderland. So some of the wearable dialysis, I, I, I couldn't find a picture of it, but it was like a 3.5 kilogram machine and patients who were using them, this machine, they traveled in the Colorado River and then they were dialyzing themselves in the afternoon and then they can do fishing somewhere and then they dialyze them in the morning. So, so the concept of home dialysis was there but again, I think it took very long uh, before we could, you know, achieve the portability of dialysis. So he thought this was an excellent program to rehab those renal patients who, despite of kidney problems, you know, they could still enjoy the life. So what were the challenges to develop these portable dialysis, right? We do have now portability in the form of PD and home hemo, but still bulky large fluids are needed, you know, but like, P even with the PD, patients can take their machine when they fly from, like one of my patients is flying to Italy, and he, he can either take his machine or he can take his fluids. So, so fluid will be shipped by FedEx wherever they go, but they can later <coughs> take the machine. So, so, and then problem with the clotting, long-term access, uh, and really the biotechnology, like technology that we can efficaciously use. So solvents which was used in the past and now are coming back again to uh, form some of these devices. So what are these solvents? So these solvents are like a series of zirconium and some other you know, substances which actually can bind to something you want to get rid of, exchange it, with something which is inbuilt there, saturate the dialysate, take the dialysate, 
which is saturated, kind of cleanse it, refresh it, and put it back. So there is a urease layer which spread the urea, which is one of the uric toxin, into the ammonia and by carbon dioxide, the gas can be, you know, de air through the chamber. But the ammonium, ammonia becomes ammonium and proton is added. So there was a mechanism to really replenish and refresh this used fluid. So what are the different futuristic options, right? So these are on PD side, hemodialysis side, and something like bioartificial or biological things which can be implanted. How many of your patients have asked you about that box that can be implanted like a kidney transplant? You know, patients, are, the doctor uh, Salman told me yesterday, like every patient knows about that box, right? So, and then they, they, some of my patients asked me, can I be the test subject for the box? I said, no, they are just doing animal trials right now. So, so, so these were some of the early 3D devices, right? So the first was this idea with the Kenza variable artificial kidney called VBAC and this AWOC, which is automated variable artificial kidney. So this, the first one, it uses a double ribbon PD catheter. So there is no, no light here, but that's fine. So there is a dialysis outflow and inflow line. There are four miniature rotary pumps, as you could see, you know, a small amount of fluid can go through PD cat, PD cavity, come back, the fluid gets kind of, you know, regenerated. But this was not uh, used because it's still experimental. There were some problems with this. The electrolyte changes and ultrafiltration control was not there. So those are some of the challenges. Patients who are aneuric, they cannot make any urine. So they need some of those devices. So they suggested maybe we can do this during the daytime and use one of the PD exchange at the night time because catheter is still there. So, so the device which is going through more testing, and this was, uh, this is AVOC system. So this system has, it's PD based. It can use double lumen catheter or single, or two single lumen catheters. What you do is, you put one to 1.5 liter of dialysate in the belly as the base fluid, so it starts it, its work. And then use 500 ml of fresh dialysate and recirculate in a tidal manner. So 500 of this kind of, you know, recirculate it again and again. Um, and then there is some ultrafiltrate generated which can be in a different bag. It's battery operated, battery life is 18 hours. So you can see there is kind of a durable or a fixed module on the right side uh, in the top picture. And then the fluid is goes through storage, then through sorbent. Then they add the bicarbonate and some of the glucose back into it. And it goes back into the belly cavity. So the so whole thing continues. So it has two major components. One is a daily cartridge. So maybe, you know, seven, after seven to eight hours, you have to replace that. So they call it originally daily, but now they're saying that you need more than one a day cartridge. And there's a monthly replaceable assembly. So ammonia sensor, some of the things which monitor the solvents. Thank you. So, um, the first study was done on 20 male patients using this technology. So there were four to 24 hours, and it showed safety, <coughs> efficacy, and the urea clearance was 31. So because this machine, you, you know, runs around the clock, so you can still get decent clearance from this AVOC technology. <coughs> the weight is only three kilos, so you can imagine patient can wear this as a jacket and can walk with this. The hemo devices. So this is, uh, this is the picture, I think this is one of the scientists, uh, I believe his name is Dr. Victor Gura on the bottom. He uh, experimented this variable hemo devices. So this is called WAC. It needs two batteries. They use 375 ml of dialysate. The blood volume is 65 ml. So again, its weight is 50, uh, 5 kilos, sorry. You can say this is also known as a jacket. So it has a double channel pulsatile counter phase flow. And I'll show you a picture as how it works. Again, it has solvent based ga gas and uh, the, the plastic is permeable. So whatever gas is generated, it can leak 
Now, there is daily exchange, blood access is needed, and anticoagulation is required. So, this is the scheme. So, so this is the dialyzer of the filter, right? So, blood comes through, gets dialyzed, go back. This is the dialyzed state. So, dialyzed state kind of goes through these uh, uh, cartridges or, or these solvent based uh, pumps and units. And then once the dialysate is clean, when it comes back, it, the bicarbonate is added, some of the electrolytes is added, so it can be regenerated to do its job again and again. So inside the filter, so this is what they do, this is kind of a push and pull. So this whole cycle, so if the increased pressure in the blood chamber, there is decreased pressure in the dialysate chamber. So this is how the pressure is created across the membrane, push, pull, push, pull. And this led to, uh, you know, the blood flow was only 100 and sometimes less. So, because you don't want to have a very high blood flow on this either, but it was still very efficacious because of this pump. So this was the first trial. This was published in Lancet back in 2007. So there were eight patients from UK, session for eight hours. Uh, blood flow 58, dialysate 47, and urea clearance was 22 ml per minute, and bracket clearance was 20. So there was no major cardiovascular issues, hemodynamic issues, or hemolysis issues with this, the first uh, kind of reported version. So then FDA uh, allowed some of these drugs through the kidney accelerator program to do fast trials. So the trial was done in 2014, and this is what happened with this trial. They published, uh, uh, should have, I think a couple of years ago. So seven patients, this was 24 hour treatment. So blood flow 42, dialysate 43. There was urea clearance, creatinine clearance 16, 17, phosphorus and beta 2 microglobs. So it was effective or efficacious, but this is what happened. <coughs> One patient, treatment was disconnected due to clotting after four hours. The other treatment was stopped because of discoloration of dialysate, so there was something happened inside the filter, the blood got mixed. Uh, trial was stopped after seven subjects due to device related malfunction. So they are trying to redo the design and see if they can improve uh, uh, some of the issues with this machine. So the redesign, and I haven't seen another trial going on on this one. So, Moving to this bioartificial kidney, and I think the, uh, we, we have, a lot of us have seen this RAG devices. So what essentially these devices did, and there was a trial about that, is back in 90s, so the, the RAG had conventional hemofilter lined with monolayer of renal cells. So two filters attached to each other in series, a CRRT filter, which is the glomerulus, and a rad filter which had renal tubeless cells lined. So this was kind of a mimicry of the natural, you know, glo this glomerulus, this tubules. So this was the glomerulus, this did the tubular function. And because the biology was stale, so these cells had immune function and also the hormonal and endocrine function. So this led to this phase two, you know, the trial, 58 patients. 40 had this RAD device, 18 CRRT alone, and they showed some survival benefit. And they believe the benefit was because of the biological functions from the cell which were attached to the RAD. So another uh, fun experiment which I would like to, to show you. So this was, um, they took the RAD kidney and they used, they decellularized these kidneys by passing a detergent through it. So renal artery, renal main, this is the ureter. So they injected this STS thing, which is just simply a detergent. It washed out all these cells, but the scaffolding or the, the linings, the kind of a building with a gray structure only. And then they infused cells, so cell recellularization. So endothelium from the artery, epithelium from the ureter, took this kidney out, re-implanted in another uh, experimental animal and did some testing. You know what? There was 
rudimentary urine. So this kidney, which cells were removed, now cells were added, kind of a similar to stem cell concept, re-implanted in a mouse. The, when the clamp was opened, just like a transplant, there was rudimentary urine which had higher concentration of both urea and creatinine. So this led to you know, some of these experimental things. A lot of things are happening simultaneously. So people are coming to this implantable artificial kidney. So there's this project going on with the Vanderbilt. I, I'm not sure if I can play the video because I was told the internet is not there. But you might have seen videos on YouTube already about how uh, these implantable, you know, there are a couple of people working. One is in Vanderbilt, Vanderbilt, one is in UCSF. So they have this coffee cup size device which can be implanted similar to a transplant. So you can see uh, the kind of the arterial connection, the venous connection, and there is a ureter as well. Um, so I think another cartoon, you can see the, they prefer the right uh, in the close side of this picture just to mimic the transplant. So the whole concept is this IAK is going to work on the blood pressure. It does not need a battery. It does not need any other pumps. So it will work on the hemodynamic <coughs> device. And you know, there are challenges too as how uh, to develop that, that things which is durable, it is efficacious and it works long term. So two concepts. One is this hemo cartridge combined with the bio cartridge. So this bio cartridge has cells, as I mentioned in the previous experiment, glomerulus and the tubule. So they use this silicon nanotechnology, which has a specific seven nanometer pore size, similar to again creating a structure similar to slit diaphragms, and it, it's the size barrier. So you know, albumin and larger particles stay behind. Potassium, sodium, other stuff, smaller stuff, they can be filtered. And this is the bioreactor, which is in the bio cartridge. Again, a similar concept. They use the same technology and add kidney cells, the kidney tube, the cells to it. So there is glomerulus function and there is a tubular function. So anything that gets filtered, these tubules are supposed to do the function of uh, the reabsorption in this bioreactor or bio cartridge. Uh, they expect that the, the patient may end up making two to four liters of urine. So how to manage patient has to weigh themselves every day and drink more water. So one of the comparison, and this is uh, going towards the last couple of slides, is so the in summary, so the first the AWOP, which is a PD-based device, lightweight, battery operated, currently in the human trials, is bloodless, portable, but then limitation is you have to change a cartridge very frequently. The WAAT I showed you, it's again battery operated, needs some, some fluid. It's going through FDA clinical trials. First trial was staff. More trials are being designed, uh, but ultra filtration is low with this, and clotting and bleeding issues are a problem. And basically, you cannot use like a fistula for a very long period of dialysis with these devices. The implantable, again, you don't need any battery power. It's it's lightweight. Patient has to drink water and electrolytes. Still in the animal models, they we are still probably a decade behind, maybe when this will be used. They think it's it's closer, but you know we have yet to see. Uh, it's implantable, and then we don't know if how long it's going to work. A kidney may work, you know, several number of years, but we don't know how long this is going to work. And they haven't really explained how when like this bioreactor will be connected. I think we yet to have seen more data. So, what do patients really need? You know, I mean, there are devices coming. There's, there is artificial intelligence, there's machine learning, there are a lot of things happening simultaneously. So not, not only will patients need some of these you know, fancy devices, but really a, a system, a feedback system. Like we have, human body is a great creation. Allah Ta'ala may, when we physiology member, I always get impressed. So we don't need like machines and all of that. So biological system has feedback loops and ability to give feedback. So we need these biosensors, devices, maybe some smart t-shirts, smart watches. And then if there are changes happening in the patient's fluid status, blood pressure, 
the machine has to give feedback to the to the dialyzer or, or your kidney in the box, which is implanted, but hey, slow down, go faster. So I think there is still more time and more technology has to emerge. These people have to go through, you know, not only the innovative problems and issues, but they have to deal with the FDA approval and some of the other challenges. So it's not like what happened to Apple. There was an innovative genius who was Steve Jobs. He combined with the business genius Tim Cook. So they took the Apple to the next level. Now the innovation has kind of gone down. It's only the business, so they keep refurbishing. So we need to have innovative people combining with the business people. So that's the only way I think these devices will get a large global uh, presence. So last slide. So this is how we started. Some of these machines we currently use to these new PD-based devices, hemo-based devices, and the implantable devices. Thank you.